revival and reformation, they are compelling and powerful words. They have been a part of all of our journeys at different times. And God would have us to reconsider that for our lives again. I've been praying over this theme for a couple of years, praying over this service for a couple of months, asking what God would have us to share. The passages I want to look at come from John 13 and 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, just kind of tab two of those, because if you don't mind, I'd like to use that little bit this morning, if that's okay. Is that okay? Amen. Now, Pastor Marie said that you could amen if, it, if you wanted to. Amen. Thank you. It's like saying, sick him to a dog, so just a little encouragement there. John 13. Now, Jesus, here in verse 1, it is just before the feast of the Passover, and, and that's not the important part here. This is. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave the world. It was getting really close to the end. Do you ever feel that way today when you watch the news? And Jesus understood this, but those in the room with him, his closest disciples, his church, didn't quite get that. They had heard it, and they understood it, but they didn't quite own it. Jesus knew that the time had come, verse 1, for him to leave the world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Or he loved them to the end. The, the idea there in the Greek is that he loved them fully. He wanted to fully reveal himself. In Sabbath school, we talked about the glory of God. Well, the glory of God in Christ Jesus was not a bolt of light. Jesus could have done that. But He's going to reveal to them the fullness, the full extent of His love, the full glory of God, the ultimate revelation to His last day church here. Hours before He's going to be crucified. Hours before a time of trouble that they had not even begun to perceive or conceive of, nor would they do very well when it began. And Jesus knew this. And so he shows them the full extent of his love. Verse 5, and after that supper, he poured water into a basin, having load, laid his cloak aside and, and wrapped himself in a towel, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. And Peter, Lord, <clears throat> Lord, <clears throat> Lord, <laughs> you're not going to wash my feet, are you? You don't realize what I'm doing here, Peter. You see, the Lord has the end in mind, the fullness of His glory to reveal, to help His disciples, His church, through what is about to occur. You don't understand, Peter. Give me some room here, Peter. You'll never wash my feet. Unless I wash you, you have no part of me. And you know how Peter responds. Did you notice that Jesus is revealing the full glory of his love? And did you notice how Peter reacted? That's odd to me. How could, how could God reveal the full extent of His love and it find such a reaction like that from Peter? 
I grew up a lot of my life in Florida. And maybe that's why it's nice to get south of Atlanta. It's, it's just nice. The warmth, anywhere south of the Nat line is good. I was, about, I was a Christian for about a year. It was 1978, the summer. And I was serving in Tampa Southside, the church I walked into and was baptized into. And I appreciated so much the testimony this morning in Sabbath school. And I was serving, having spent uh, nine months at Southern, preparing for ministry. I came back to help with the youth and the pastor, Ralph Cruz. And uh, we were going to have, God was doing something great in that little church. It wasn't a large church, but God had done a, was doing a revival there, and there were all kinds of young people, and I was one of them from the previous year. And we were going to have an agape feast. And so... Um, and so Ralph you know, had a lot of things for me to do, and of course he had Sabbath services to get ready for, and so we were working and hustling and bustling, and, and, uh, and I was running around, and in those days I had a 1974, and only a guy would remember these kind of things, but a 74 Red Maverick, two-door, black interior, and who needs air conditioning when you're young? <laughs> you wanted the window down anyway. So that was my car, and I was running all over, had full intention to go home and clean up before Friday night agape feast, but it, you know, as typical in ministry, stuff happens, stuff just occurs. And before you know it, the kids are beginning to come into that fellowship hall there in Tampa Southside, and I can still remember that evening, sundown hadn't come yet, but the sun was just filling that fellowship hall, the terrazzo floors were gleaming. And we had all set up, and Ralph was getting ready, the Pastor Cruz was getting ready to share a little devotional. And I thought, oh, well, I, I'll, it'll be okay. Well, Ralph shares a little devotional, and before we have the agape feast, we're kind of replicating John 13 a little bit, so we're going to have foot washing. And so little Chip, Chip, a teenager, comes up to me, you know, and says, hey, can I wash your feet? I said, sure, I'd love to. Great, Chip's my man, my bud, you know. So we, you know, go off to the side, have a little prayer, and he says, can I serve you first? I said, sure. So I reach down and begin to slip off my shoes, and then it hits me. Now, I have what you call rusty fingers. I'm an en- I used to be an engineer. Rusty fingers means that when you're touching fresh metal, if you're not careful, you leave a little moisture, and you, leave a little, you create beginnings of some rust. In other words, I sweat a lot. Now, none of this really made any sense to me at the time until I reached down and began to take off my shoes <laughs> on that hot summer day, having ridden in my red Maverick with black interior, no air conditioning all day. <laughs> and I slipped my shoe off and I peeled my sock off and all of a sudden I was moved. I was moved with an incredible amount of embarrassment. And Chip was averting his head. And it was a sacred time. And I was so embarrassed. I said, oh, Chip, I'm so sorry. And he carefully washed my feet as best he could. And I was, I had intended to go home because I didn't want to come to foot washing with dirty feet. I like to have clean feet for foot washing. Good socks, a little foot powder maybe. (laughs) Maybe some cologne. I don't want to come to foot washing with smelly feet. I don't want to come to God in the reality of my brokenness. I want to come to Him in my goodness and in a measure of strength and wholeness. And Peter, you're not going to wash my feet, Lord, as if he were saying, 
I don't need you to wash my feet, Jesus. Ellen White says in commenting about this passage in Desire of Ages 646, Christ had come to wash the heart from the stain of sin, and in refusing to allow Christ to wash his feet, Peter was refusing that higher cleansing. He was really rejecting his Lord. And then she goes on to say something profound. The truest humility is to receive with a thankful heart any provision made in our behalf. Amen. Peter's role, the call for Peter then, was to humbly submit the stain of sin into the hands of Christ. To come boldly to the throne of grace in the fullness of his brokenness and sin and to throw himself into the hands of Jesus. And Jesus was there on his knees, wrapped in a towel, ready to receive him. And Peter says, I don't need you. He desired to wash the sins of Peter away. He desired, he desired to wash the fears that possessed Peter. All the alienation, all the jealousy, all the pride that Peter held that was captured by fear. Jesus longed in these last moments of his life to secure Peter for the future. And many times, just like Peter, we use positions and titles and money, even stooping so far as to use religion as a way of presenting ourselves to God as worthy and noble. With Jesus on his knees, wrapped in his towel, waiting to receive us, to wash away our sins. It's a reminiscent story, a story that goes back to the beginning of time where sin is recorded there in Genesis 3. That time where, where Adam and Eve were so pure and so beautiful, so, so noble, so in harmony with the Creator. They walked and they talked and they laughed and they loved until they ate of the tree. And then in the cool of the day, in the cool of the day, Jesus, God Himself, comes again to meet with that first couple. But because of sin, the Bible says in chapter 3 of Genesis that they noticed they were naked and they were ashamed. They were filled with fear, and so they took figs and sowed to make clothes, and they went and hid in the garden from the presence of God, from the very voice of God. And God eventually finds them. And they are ashamed and they are afraid of God. And so they present themselves clothed in their little fig leaves. They present themselves in their own covering and garments as though nothing is wrong. As though God can't see through it. As though God is simply a God of the exterior. As though God only sees the surface of us. Peter was no better than this couple in the garden. No better than the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law with their robes and their tassels and their phylacteries, how they walked around professing in religious tones and garments and all the time planning to crucify Jesus himself. 
even with Christianity, with all of its creeds and pomps and religious services and prayers, we do the same thing at times. We create great cathedrals rather than coming boldly before the throne of grace, throwing ourselves upon Him for mercy. Because we are afraid of Him. For the very nature and character of sin has created fear birthed within us. And we're afraid. Adventism was called into existence 150 years ago. Not simply to proclaim truths about God, not simply to restore the lost biblical truths of the Word like the Sabbath and the state of the dead and the sanctuary, but to really, to really reveal the great controversy, to really reveal the truth about God. The very nature and character of God has been falsely portrayed even by the Christian church. For the very nature of God is not to be feared, for God is not a God to be feared, but a God to be loved. And Jesus on His knees is revealing the glory of God, the fullness of God's love. There on His knees, wrapped in a towel, wanting to bathe them and to cleanse them and to enter into a relationship with them that would sustain them for what was going to happen in just a few moments. Adam and Eve give us this picture of what has been birthed in us. We possess it. We own it. It's ours in that plain in Taishung, Taiwan, I was born with it in my mother's womb. I was conceived in sin. I didn't have to do something. I didn't have to break something. I am broken. I didn't have to leave God. I was born away from God. It is God who came after me. I didn't come after Him. He sought me out. He sought you out. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Amen? Amen? It was Jesus Christ who came to the world 2,000 years ago to seek and save that which is lost. You and me. That's why He resurrected a church 150 years ago to do the same thing. Because people like you and me are birthed in fear, birthed in sin, birthed alienated from our Savior. And the truth of God has been covered up. Is that too harsh on Peter? Am I being a little too critical of this fella? Remember now, remember this evening. Remember the evening Jesus is kneeling before him. Because Jesus in just a few moments says, now you know someone here is going to deny me. And whatever you do, do quickly. And Judas got up and went out. And the disciples really didn't know what was going on. And so they all go around the circle and, how oh, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? You know? And Peter says, I don't care if everyone denies you. I'll never deny you. Moments later after this interchange. And you remember the words of Jesus. Peter, Peter doesn't even know himself. He is lost in the illusion even of himself. He doesn't know who he really is. He won't even allow himself to see himself as he really is. That is the deceitfulness even of sin. Though all men deny you, I will never deny you. And Jesus says, before the rooster crows in the morning, Peter, you will have denied me three times. Second Corinthians chapter 4. A powerful, I've been, God has been, I've been circling this passage for about a year. 
I'll go away, but he keeps pulling me back to it, pulling me back to it, pulling me back to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is talking to the church in Corinth. And he says down there in verse 3 that this gospel is veiled. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that transforms people has been veiled and it is veiled to those who are perishing. Verse 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. That is what sin has done. It has blinded humanity. It has blinded us to who God really is. And for most of humanity, we have created an image about God that does not exist. It is not real. It is shaped by a lie from the father of lies, the devil, Lucifer, Satan, that old serpent that God is to be feared and cannot be trusted. And that illusion, that lie, has encompassed the hearts and the minds of every human being. And there in verse 6, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness. Where did God say that? In the beginning, in Genesis, in the midst of darkness, God said, Let there be light, and what? There was light, and it was very dark good. God spoke light and it was. Do you understand what Paul's saying here? In the midst of people's lives who are steeped in darkness, who are steeped by not knowing God, God comes to them and through the revelation of the gospel, He speaks light into their darkness. He speaks life into their death. He speaks healing into their brokenness. Where there is darkness, God speaks light. Let there be light. And He made His light to shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ Himself. That's what Jesus was doing at the feet of Peter. Trying to speak into him with his presence. Trying to speak into him through the washing of water. Trying to model for him the very glory of God Almighty himself. Peter, I know what's about to happen to you. I know what you're going to face in a matter of moments. I know you don't even know yourself. Peter, come to me. Let me help you. Let me hold you. For I love you with an everlasting love, Peter. I will not let you go, Peter. Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just one chapter over, in, chapter, in verse 14, that this love that now possesses a person possessed Paul, and he says that it is this love that compels us. It compels us because what was dead is now alive. There in verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Fear has gone. Darkness has gone. Light and life and hope and love have been embraced. They have opened themselves and the glory of God is revealed in the life of a believer. You and me, dead in our sins, we come to Christ Jesus and we say yes to Him and He speaks and we become born again. New children of eternity. It is our destiny to be reunited with our Creator, the one who has longed to embrace us. And yet we keep him at arm's length with fear. What are you afraid of today? What are you afraid of today in reference to God? 
that he will find out about you? That he will see you for who you really are? He knows us. He knows the numbers of hairs on our head. And some of us don't, he doesn't have to count very far. <laughs> but he knows us. And he loves us anyway. And the full glory of his love is revealed when we come boldly to him. And we offer ourselves completely to Him, transparently to Him, and He breathes life into us. He speaks light, and light comes. Amen. And so Jesus continues for the next couple of chapters back in John. He's trying to encourage these believers. He's trying to encourage this new church. And he spends a couple of chapters there. It's a powerful section in John. I'm reading through it again in my devotions. It's just this powerful time when Jesus is, it's like, it's like he knows the clock is ticking down. He's going to be taken away and they're going to be alone, standing there all alone in the garden. And he's doing everything he can to help them. Prepare them for that moment. And so in John 14, we hear those beautiful words. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms. I go and prepare a place for you. That where I'm going, where I am, you can come also. You're going to feel like you're alone and you're abandoned. You're going to create all kinds of shields and exterior things. Trust me. He goes on in John 15, Abide in me and I will abide in you. There in John 14, he clearly says, after he says, let not your heart be troubled. You remember how he ends that little section? He says, he says listen guys, remember, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the way. I am the life. I am the truth. He even goes on to talk about the Holy Spirit there in chapter 14, verse 16 and 19. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate, another counselor, a paraclete, a friend. He will give you God Himself in the presence of the Spirit will come alongside to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world neither sees Him nor knows Him. Remember Paul going back to their illusion, the veil before their eyes? They can't see, they're blinded by their fear. The world can neither see Him because they are afraid of God. They have embraced the lie about God. They will not surrender themselves to the truth about God and trust Him. But you know Him. Not about Him. You don't know things about Him. You don't know creeds and doctrines and truths. You don't have memory verses. You know Him. For He lives with you and will be in you. Paul says the Holy Spirit is given as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. The Spirit of God is not something that's out there. It's not a similar theology of God. It is the, 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 the part of God that inhabits the life of everyone who opens themselves to God. Amen. He takes up residence in us. 
It literally stirs my emotions to the deepest level to realize that I am not alone. I have not been abandoned. I matter. For God has His eye on you and me. You and I are the beloved of the Father. Nothing is more important to Him than you or I. We are the reason He has come because we have been birthed in this lie and we have been made captive by the fear of sin, that sin has created within us. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Ellen White says in Education 260 about this relationship with Christ, it should not be for a pause, for a moment in His presence. She said, but we should personally connect with Christ to sit down in companionship with Him. This is our need. I need a constant, we need a constant reorientation about our own nature and the nature of God, and we need it daily. For no sooner do I embrace this truth, and I walk down the hall, and I get in the car, and I go along in life, and then this depraved, sinful nature pops its head up, for it is not dead, it is still alive. And I'm faced with a decision just like you. Do I embrace it and, sur and surrender it into the presence of Christ? Can I acknowledge it and ask Him to not only wash me, but cleanse me from all unrighteousness? Or do I create masks and layers and robes and tassels and prayers and songs and pretend and live in an illusion that nothing really is wrong? Are you tired of that emptiness? Are you tired of going through the motions with a faith that is not fundamentally altering your life? Then you must come boldly before the throne of grace without any pretense. People of integrity transparently surrendering all of you to God all of your brokenness, all of your fears, all of your hopes and your dreams and your failures to Him. He knows of them already. And He is longing to embrace you. When I was a teenager, um, my mother's English, and um, I got this uh, paper route. And it was a, a great gig, so to speak, <laughs> because I loved making money, and, um, and I was able to do that before school. And uh, the, the problem was is that I liked to sleep, and I was not different from any other teenager. And, uh, and uh, in England, not only did I like to sleep, I didn't like to get out of bed, because uh, our home wasn't uh, centrally heated, and uh, that cold linoleum you know, sheeting was on the flooring. And, and even though that hot water bottle felt good at night, it, 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 you know, the body heat kind of created that little blanket of warmth, and I didn't want to get out of bed. But every morning, mom, mom, about five o'clock, would get me up. She'd wake me up. Pool. Pool. Time to get up, Pool. Ooh. She persisted until I got up. And without fail, I would come down to a breakfast fit for a king. Usually it would be oatmeal or porridge as we called it, and some good hearty English toast with good real butter sitting on it. and a pot of tea and a table full of love, not in words, but in deeds. 
Sometimes it would be a surprise and sometimes I'd have a plate of kippers and a couple scrambled eggs. Never without fail did she ever let me go hungry. She filled me every day. I long for those breakfasts again. Morning by morning, Isaiah says, he calls me by name. Morning by morning, He wakens me to speak to me so that I might hear His Word and live. In the morning, I will come to you. Come unto me, all you that labor. Come unto me, all you that are afraid. Come unto me, all you that are worried and troubled. And I will give you rest because I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life, Jesus says. Do not fear, Isaiah 43, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. I believe with all my heart that God wants to meet you in the morning. I believe with all my heart God wants to wash your feet of your sins and your fears and to prepare you and to fill you for the day ahead. For you and me to surrender all of our hopes and our dreams and our plans at His feet. And to let Him feed us through the living Word. For He will speak light into our darkness. Life into our death. Hope into our despair. He will quieten our fears as quickly as He quietened the storm on that stormy night. For I have loved you, he said, with an everlasting love, and I will not, I cannot let you go. Nothing matters more to God than you. Revival, reformation, it's not an outside thing. It's not learning how to dress differently on the outside. It's not wearing different robes or tassels or prayers. No, it's an inside thing. Change, real change, occurs not from outside in, but inside out. He's going to call you in the morning. Are you going to hear him? On his knees, wrapped in his towel, to receive you and me. Father, we're gathered in your presence right now, and the Spirit is doing something here that only it can do. It's talking to us individually and personally. We know that revival is our greatest need. We know that the model you gave for us was one where you got up well before the breaking of day and sought the strength of your Father. And so, Father, we want to give ourselves to You. We want to put ourselves in Your hands. We want to ask that You would cleanse us. That You would restore us. That You would save us. That You would revive us. 
by breathing into us the word of the living God morning by morning. Father, where there is fear right now in the hearts of some of us in this room, I pray that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ would penetrate it right now. That where there is darkness, a shaft of light will break through that right now into the very heart of any individual that's filling that darkness right now. And that we would allow life to be birthed right there. A new life. A new creation. Restored. Remade. Beginning a journey into your image. And so, Father, right now we ask the Holy Spirit to move on us. Cleanse us, O Lord. In Christ's name we thank you.